Good morning. Wow. Two weeks. It's been about two weeks since we've been live. So I am so excited to be here with you guys. I'm so sorry I've been gone, but I had such a great time. I had um, vacation with family, and those of you that have got to vacation with family know how awesome that is. So I got to go to North Carolina and surprise family and make a visit and it was a really, really great time. Um, we're going to go in and invite some people. And some people said they hadn't seen the invites. They don't know where they come in. I don't usually get invited to stop <laughs> on this, so I don't really know. I know some people get it and they see them, but I don't know why others don't. So I'm going to just throw in the invites like I've been doing. And, um, of course, always just go ahead, like and share and uh, follow along with us. And if you have any prayer requests or anything we can lift you up for, please feel free to um, join in with that as well. And we will, okay, I think I'm done with that. We're going to go ahead and get started. All right, let's go ahead and open in prayer. Lord, we just thank you for today and we thank you um, that we're able to get into your word and we thank you that you you love us and you call each of us by name and we're precious to you and Lord we just want to worship you give you honor and praise and glory in Jesus name amen all right I'm in a little different angle we moved the table to a different spot I kind of like kind of like it so I don't know we'll, we'll see how it goes um, we are going to be in First Chronicles 15 today, and we're talking about how the ark was brought to Jerusalem. Okay, now, in First and Second Kings, we heard a lot of these stories. Now, in First and Second Chronicles, they're some of the same stories, but a little bit more um, background on them. So we're going to get a little bit more detail. So you might have heard the story already before from when we were in First and Second Kings, but this time we're going to get more of what actually happened. So here we are, First Chronicles 15, and David built houses for himself in the city of David. This is Jerusalem, this is the city of David. And he prepared a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. Then David said that no one but the Levites may carry the ark of God. For the Lord had chosen them to carry the ark of the Lord and to minister to him forever. And David assembled all Israel at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord to its place and which he had prepared for it. And David gathered together the sons of Aaron and the Levites of the sons of Kohath, Uriel, the chief, with 120 of his brothers of the sons of Merari, Asiah, the chief, with 220 of his brothers. Um, hold on, let me get this. Oh... It's spinning. I think it's still going, so we're going to keep going. Uh, with 220 of its brothers of the sons of Gershom, Joel the chief with 130 of his brothers of the sons of Eli Elisabon, Shimei the chief with 200 of his brothers of the sons of Hebron, Eliel the chief with 80 of his brothers of the sons of Uziel, Aminadab the chief with 112 of his brothers, Let's do that. Okay, that disappeared. Good. The 112 of his brothers. Then David summoned the priests of Zadok and Abathar and the Levites, Uriel, Asiah, Joel, Shemaiah, Eliel, Aminadab, and said to them, that was a lot of names, um, you are the heads of the fathers of the house of the Levites. Consecrate yourselves, you and your brothers, so that you may bring up the ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, to the place that I have prepared for it. Because you did not carry it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not seek him according to the rule. So they tried to bring, oops, they tried, oh, it's me doing that, sorry. Ah, okay. They tried to bring the Ark of the Covenant um, up to Jerusalem, but not the way God had intended. So it caused God to break out against them, meaning that he probably either struck somebody dead or, or they got sick or something like that. I missed yesterday, so we'll have to catch up. Um, 
So now they're trying to follow the rule of what they're supposed to do. So the priests and the Levites consecrated themselves to bring up the Ark of the Lord, the God of Israel, and the Levites carried the Ark of God on their shoulders with the poles as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. So now they're trying to make sure that they're doing all according to the word of the Lord. I'm going to scoot you guys closer because I feel like you guys are way too far away and I don't want you to not be able to hear. Okay, I think that should be good. Okay. Alrighty, so David also commanded the chiefs of the Levites to appoint their brothers as the singers who should play loudly on musical instruments on harps and lyres and cymbals to raise sounds of joy. So the Levites appointed Heman, the son of Joel, and of his brothers Asaph, the son of Barakai, and the sons of Merari, their brothers Ethan, the son of Cushiah, and with them their brothers of the second order, Zechariah, Jaziel, Sheremoth, Jehiel, Unai, Eliab, Benai, Messiah, Mattiah, Elifu, and Mechaniah, and the gatekeepers Obed-Edom and Jael. The singers, Heman, Asaph, and Ethan, and Asaph, you can actually see the name Asaph um, listed under some of the Psalms as Psalms created by Asaph. So that would make sense since the Psalms are songs and he is one of the singers. Uh, were to sound bronze cymbals, uh, Ethan were to sound bronze, Zechariah, Aziel, Shemariah, Jehiel, Unai, Eliab, Messiah, Benaiah were to play harps according to Alamoth. But Matthiah, Elifu, Mekaniah, Obed-Edom, Jezeel, and Isaiah were to lead with leaders according to Shemeth. Chaniah, leader of the Levites in music, should direct the music for he understood it. And I guess not everybody understood the music, so it was important that they had someone that did. Barakai and Elanaka, El Elkanah were to be gatekeepers for the ark. Shebaniah, Josephat, Nathanael, and Messiah, Zechariah, Benaiah, and Eliezer, the priests, should blow the trumpets before the Ark of God. Obed-Edom and Jehiah were to be gatekeepers for the Ark. So we had a couple, two, two different sets of people that were gatekeepers for the Ark. So David and the elders of Israel and the commanders of the thousands went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house of Obed-Edom with rejoicing. And because God helped the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, they sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. And David was clothed with a robe of fine linen, as also were the Levites who were carrying the Ark, and the singers of the Chaniah, the leader of the music, and, and the, wait, were all the, Le as, as also were all the Levites who were carrying the Ark, and the singers, and Chaniah, the leader of the music, of the singers. And David wore a linen ephod. So all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting to the sound of the horn, trumpet, cymbals, and made loud music on harps and lyres. And as the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came to the city of David, Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David dancing and rejoicing, and she despised him in her heart. And this is actually less information that we got from 1 Kings. Hi, Randy. Thanks. Glad that you're here. We're in... Um, First Chronicles, uh, First Chronicles 18 or 15. Um, this is actually less information than we got from First Kings because we talked about how he came up dancing and rejoicing, and Mikhail did not just despise him in her heart, but like tried to slam him with her words and was saying, you know, he looked like a fool out there dancing and um God struck her barren until she died, so she didn't ever bear children. So, you know, you shouldn't condemn people that are worshiping God because everybody worships God different, and um, you don't want to be judged for that, right? <laughs> but, yeah. She despised him in her heart. One, because he took her back from um, her husband because Saul had given her to him, to David, but then didn't want to give her to David, so he gave her to another person. But then David said, no, I'm going to claim her as my wife. And so then he took her back from the husband that he had. So yeah, it was a big mess. So that's probably also why she despised him in her heart. So the ark placed in a tent. So we're in chapter 16 of First Chronicles. 
And they brought in the ark of God and set it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before God. And when David had finished offering the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord and distributed to all Israel, both men and women, to each a loaf of bread, a portion of meat, and a cake of raisins. That doesn't seem like it would be a lot, but he gave it to every single person in Israel. So, yeah, that's kind of a lot of bread and meat and cakes and raisins. So he wanted them all to share in the blessings of being there. Good morning, Susan, glad that you're here. We're in First Chronicles 16. So then he appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the Ark of the Lord to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Asaph was the chief, and second to him were Zechariah, Jael, Shemaroth, Jahiel, Matthiah, Eliab, Beniah, Obed-Edom, and Jael, who were to play harps and lyres. Asaph was to sound the cymbals, and Benaiah and Jahiel, Jahiel, the priests, were to blow the trumpets regularly before the Ark of the Covenant of God. And then on that day, David first appointed that thanksgiving be sung to the Lord by Asaph and his brothers. So we see that there is um, rejoicing going on. We see that now that the Ark is back in Jerusalem, people are worshiping and praising God, and so it's a good place. Um, now we're going to hear David's song of thanks. And his song is, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him, sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done. His miracles and the judgments he uttered, O offspring of Jerusalem, or O offspring of Israel, his servant, sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. He is the Lord our God. His judgments are all are in all the earth. Remember his covenant forever, the word that he commanded for a thousand generations. His word is commanded not just for then, but for now and for all time. His word stands true. His word never fails. His word is what we can take hope in and um, persevere with. The covenant that he made with Abraham, he has sworn promise to Isaac, which he confirmed as a statute to Jacob. And that's a tribute there to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being the forefathers of the people of Israel as an everlasting covenant to Israel saying to you I will give the land of Canaan as your portion portion for an inheritance when you were few in number and of little account and sojourners in it wandering from nation to nation from one kingdom to another people he allowed no one to oppress them he rebuked kings on their account saying touch not my anointed ones do not do my prophets no harm so they were always protected by the hand of the Lord, and God always sought to make sure that they were okay. Sing to the Lord all the earth, tell of his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among the peoples, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And he is to be held in awe above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. That is still true today. All the idols, all the gods that we put in our lives and worship that we think are important. And you may say you not you do not have gods or idols in your life, but we do. We worship our jobs. We worship our health. We worship our family. We worship our spouses. Some of us even worship our dogs. I mean, when those things come before and in place of God, they become idols in our lives. And God, for all the gods of the peoples, are idols. Those are idols. Those are not living things that are have created themselves, but have been created. And God made the heavens. The Lord made the heavens. And he is the one to be worshipped. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are in his place. Ascribe to the Lord, O clans of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, the Lord 
reigns. Let the sea roar in all that fills it. Let the field exult in everything in it. Then shall the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He came first to seek and to save the lost. And that's why I'm able to be here and you're able to listen. But the next time he comes, he comes to judge. He comes to judge what we've done with the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what have you done with the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Say also, save us, O God, of our salvation, and gather and deliver us from among the nations, that we may give thanks to your holy name and glory in your praise. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Then all the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. And that's a, that's a beautiful way to end that, right? So we see that the, the ark ended up in Jerusalem. David is giving praise and thanks to God, and the people are saying amen saying that they agree, saying that they're in the same place with David, saying that they all also give honor and glory to God. And so that ends our Old Testament reading, and we go into Romans, Romans 1, 18. And um, we're in a new book. We were in Acts for a very long time, so now we're in Romans. And it's talking about God's wrath on unrighteousness. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. We can't say that we didn't know. We can't say that we, we never heard because you can see God in creation. You can see God in, in all the created things around us, in, the, in nature, in the weather, in the solar system. We can see God in all that has been created. And we are, what does it say right here? They are without excuse. We are without excuse. There is no excuse for not knowing and praising God for who and what he is. We choose to try and make excuses that we didn't know or we 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 don't believe it but you can say whatever you want but there is no excuse acceptable because God has given you all that you need to be able to know who he is by creation by what's around you for although they knew God they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him but they became futile in their thinking now they're speaking about those that have known God know who he is but they, they get to where they get lazy, they stop honoring him, they stop giving him thanks. And so futile thinking would be, they're thinking, they're not unthinking people, they're thinking, but they're not thinking of the things of God, which means that they have futile thinking, meaning they're thinking about things that don't matter at all. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Because they're not um, giving honor and glory to God, because they are acting as if they don't know him, they, their foolish hearts are darkened, meaning that though they have an, a knowledge of God, the darkness of this world is, is, has taken over their hearts, so they don't have the ability then to honor and praise God because they have chosen to not give him honor and praise. Claiming to be wise, which a lot of people in this day and age claim to be wise, they claim that they have their college and masters and, and their high education but unfortunately that doesn't make them fool that makes them fools because they don't have a knowledge of God to have wisdom in this world doesn't necessarily mean you have the wisdom of God and so claiming to be wise wisdom that is not from God they became fools because they lacked the wisdom of God and exchanged the glory of the immortal God which we do when we we have the glory of the immortal God when we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But if we exchange that for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things, then we lose our, our closeness with the almighty God. You know, we can't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and have a personal relationship with idols 
and things that we worship. God doesn't want to share us. God wants to be in an exclusive relationship with us. And the only way we can have that is by being exclusively his. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their heart to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So the creature... The created is everything that we see around us. Anything that you see has been created. Those things are not to be worshipped because they had no power in and of themselves. They are only here because there is a creator. And the creator is God, Jesus Christ, who created all things. And so he is worthy of honor and glory and praise and worship, not the things that he created, right? So for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And the due penalty for their error is simply being separated from God. The due penalty for their error is them being blinded in their thinking and their, and their hearts, darkened to what God's wisdom and knowledge is. And this scripture, this is not, again, my words or my direction at 630. Um, but this is the word of God. So if you don't agree with this, I totally, you totally have that option, but it's not me that's saying it, it's God's word. So you can take it up with God because I'm just speaking God's word. Um, that's what God's word says. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of uncleanness unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. And of all these things listed in here, I find that disobedient to parents listed among being murderers and ruthless just i think in our day and age we would take that as like wow how is that equal to that but it is because our disobedience to our parents is pretty much equal to those things so we need to think of that when we are not honoring to our parents right so though they knew so though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So now herein lies the problem. These are not people that don't, that don't know God. So not that that makes it any better, but God holds those accountable that have a personal relationship with him and then choose to shelve that relationship and do things that are contrary to him. He holds them to a different standard than those that truly have never heard of God, don't have anything or any relationship with God, and are doing their own thing. Yet all should know who God is by creation. Those that don't have never heard are going to be held to a different standard than those that have heard and then chose to just reject God completely. And that's what God is saying. They, they not only have given up their relationship with God to take on the things of this world, but they are approving those that are doing that as well. So that's causing others to stumble and fall. So it's one thing when you cause yourself to stumble and fall, but then when you lead others and approve of others stumbling and falling, then you're held accountable for them as well. Also, I mean, we're all held accountable for ourselves, but God knows your heart. And if you're purposely trying to lead people away from God, yeah, you're going to get held accountable for that, right? That's some heavy stuff for first thing in the morning, right? Okay, so we're going to leave our Old Testament reading right there. We're going to go into Psalms 10. Psalms 10, 1 through 15, why do you hide yourself, it says. 
Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked, wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised, for the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounce God, renounces God. When we become consumed with the things of this world, we shelve God. There's, there's no way to do both. You can't do both. You can't worship and honor God and be greedy for gain or boast of the wicked things that are in your heart. You can't do that. You can't do both. So really it's what are you doing with the name of Jesus Christ? What are you doing with God in your life? In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high out of his sight. For As for all his foes, he puffs at them. <laughs> yes, that's puffing at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his chung, tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the villages and hiding places. He murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He, lur he lurks that he may seize the poor. He seizes the poor when he draws them into his net. So we see this guy setting people up. He's setting people up to ambush them, to drag them away, to murder them, either with his thoughts or his actions. He's basically not a good person. Why? Because he has exchanged the truth of God to the lie of this world that there is no God. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He has hidden his face. He will never see it. And that is a lie of the enemy because God sees all things. God knows all things. God has been is and always will be so we are not without god good morning karen glad that you're here we're in psalms uh psalms 10. so we can we are always with god we can always know that god is there whether we want him to be there or not so now it goes on to say arise O lord verse 12 O oh God, lift up your hand, forget not the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see, for your no you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it into your hands. To you, the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper to the fatherless. And the fatherless being those that are orphans in our day and age that have no one to look after them. Children from divorced homes that are, that are constantly back and forth between parents. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. And God does call us into account. God does call us um, to stand accountable for what we say and do. And there will be a time when we will stand accountable before God. And God will ask, what have you done with my son? And Or he will say, well done, good and faithful servant, right? But if you have no answer for what you've done with the name of Jesus Christ, that will be your account that you will have to give. And without Jesus Christ standing for you, you, you are standing against him. There's only two places to stand. And it's kind of heavy, but there we are with that one. So here we are in Proverbs 19, 6 and 7. This is the last scripture for the day. Many seek the favor of a generous man, and everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts, right? And that's true today. Everyone wants to be the lotto winner's best friend, right? But all a poor man's brothers hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He pursues them with words, but does not have them. So if you have friends only because of what you have, then maybe perhaps they are truly not your friends. And I think a poor man would truly see who his friends are because they would be his friends not for what he has, but for who he is. And you should have friends also, not for what you have, but for who you are. And 
if you don't know who you are, if you have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I encourage you to take the time today and seek out God and to want to know who he is and to want to have a personal relationship with him because it's truly the only relationship that matters. Thank you so much for your time. Um, this is Friday, so we're going to be gone for a couple days for the weekend, but we will be back on Monday. I look forward to seeing you then, and um, God bless.